liner. Little and then liner again, but it's picked up by England. Now he has a chance for England. Gascott, that's caught him. Now he has the pace of Tony Underwood on the outside. Damien Smith will struggle to catch him. Damien Smith, will he get him? Damien Smith has missed him and Tony Underwood will score. A great try to England. So here we are. Hello and a really warm welcome to this brief introduction to the Facing Your Jonah program within the Tony Talk series. Now, first things first, and just to totally confuse you, I'm not Tony Underwood. I'm actually the series editor, Paul Sowerby, and you're hearing from me first because unlike many former sports megastars and high-flying pilots, this one is actually pretty useless at blowing his own trumpet which I've got to say has always seemed a bit crazy to me, given how amazing and, well, unique his achievements have been. And I really do mean unique. Thinking about it, first of all, only a thin slice of the population has played rugby 27 times for England, won a Grand Slam, and toured not once, but twice with the British Lions. And then only an equally thin slice has captained the world's biggest passenger aircraft, the mighty A380 double-decker. But you know, only one person has ever done both. I don't know about you, Tony, but I think (laughs) that's one hell of an intro. (laughs) I think so, mate. That's very good. Well, uh, yeah, combination may be unique, but I don't think I could describe myself as being unique. But uh, yeah, thank you. Very proud to hear those things listed. Uh, uh, it is always uh, just nice to remind myself or be, be reminded of it every now and then. But yeah, proud. It's a privilege, privilege to have had those experiences. And um, yeah, some amazing high points in my life. So thanks. Thanks for reminding me. Appreciate it. Pleasure. Um, I suppose <laughs> before we get cracking, um, just by way of a bit of context, we should probably just pause for a second to remember that you scaled breathtaking heights at the top of your chosen sport, rugby only to come crashing down through injury. You then picked yourself up, dusted yourself down, and embarked on a second career, flying, and reached equally giddy heights at the top of that, only to then, I was going to say come crashing down, but only to (laughs) then find yourself, you know, on the receiving end of the so-called COVID redundancy call. Um, I suppose before we go any further, I should be saying, how are you? (laughs) Um, well, frankly, Paul, um, yeah, was devastated. Uh, like a lot of people out there, uh, I mean, well, better way, really, it just felt like I've been hit by 380 again of, of one of my own. But uh, yeah, didn't expect it came out of the blue like it has for so many people. But um, yeah, but thankfully, uh, um, yeah, I think that's what we had to talk about, the recoveries from the setbacks I've had in the past and indeed this one. And and, and the pivots I've gone through in my uh, life, as you've mentioned there, the different career changes I've had and, to make those choices when and facing these stark realities of a of a change being required and um, it's provided learning points and i think um, hopefully i've learned some of those lessons put them into practice and turning things around now so appreciate it but thank you I mean, you talk about lessons of course there and, and and one of your let's say higher profile teachers was one 19 year old kiwi called jonah lomu now you know <laughs> that teacher stood six foot five tall i believe he I think I I remember he tipped the scales at around 20 stone and back in 95, of course, was running the 100 metres in a shade outside the Olympic qualifying time. Now, you lined up opposite him that day. Give us a feel for why you think he and that match, of course, is still talked about 25 years later. Well, he obviously, because uh, in the context, as you say, so young and and also such a revelation in sport, you talk about people who transcend the sport, probably Jonah in our sport in rugby union was very much one of those characters, maybe the, you know, the equivalent to your Tiger Woods or in golf and Michael Jordan in basketball. But, you know, in, in context, as I say, it was a World Cup. It was a, a stage for anyone playing in that tournament, but it was very much his, you know, um, uh, for, for him to have gone through that tournament, and pretty much dominated teams all the way along um, against, you know, an England team that day. We'd, we'd had a very successful game the week before we'd beaten Australia in the quarter final who were the world champions uh, we'd won a grand slam which basically means we'd won all the home nations against England Scotland Ireland Wales and France um, beaten all of those so we were unbeaten very confident myself personally as well got the uh, try behind me the week before 
So it's a massive challenge um, uh, when you're facing anybody in a, in a semi-final of a World Cup. It's a massive challenge when you're facing the uh, the All Blacks. But yeah, you talk about a massive challenge. They don't come much bigger in a in an individual form than Jonah himself, because as I said, and you said, a frame with the speed and that combination was just uh, really unheard of at that time. Of course, um, not only was he a giant, but that afternoon he was <laughs> he was a jolly angry giant. Um, I mean, it, it was widely reported, you know, that one of the reasons why he was as mad as a bag of badgers by the time the whistle went was due to you winking at him while he did his pre-match war dance. I mean, what was that all about? Did you have a death wish? <laughs> Look, come on, Paul, you know me, I'm smiley, happy chappy that I am. I couldn't possibly wish that <laughs> yeah, on, my, on myself. But uh, yeah, he was. I think um, I've been uh, told that he'd been fed uh, lots of uh, quotes during the week. Some, most of them, I think, taken out of context, but just uh, really, to, uh, they felt that was a good technique. To, it worked on the games previously to get him fired up for the match, uh, like he needed any firing up with the frame that he had. But yeah, he certainly uh, came in the game angry with some quotes that I'd se- seemingly said that I was going to show him, etc. Uh, and as he said, he was going to show me uh, the wink. Well, I don't know what was going on there, but uh, the, the harker, uh, for anyone who don't know, it, it's a it's a tribal war sort of off uh, sort of uh, dance for want of a better word that um, they do in Maori and Pacific Island culture and it's just to lay down a challenge and it's up to you to accept it well we all do don't we it's a game of rugby we're, we're about to dance the dance on a rugby field and um, uh, I, I was I tried to nod at him and I must have had something in my eye when the wink came out but obviously he, he didn't need any more firing up but he certainly got it from what I inherently possibly maybe gave him a wink <laughs> I think, um, you know, seriously for a moment, we it did occur to me, though, that you know we've been through the things that you've done in your life. And I suppose when the highs have been so high, presumably the lows are very, very low indeed. Yeah, Paul, I mean, I, I, I gave it some context to say we were come off some very high highs in the in previous year and beaten quarterfinals or to try personally. Uh, but the game definitely didn't go our way. And we're talking about low. That was, you know, uh, probably the lowest I had in any form in, in my rugby career. Um, I very much go in, in games with an aspect of the nervous tension is really there because you don't want to let anyone down, uh, your teammates, etc. But one thing you've got to realize with sport, I'm sure people do, is, um, you know, what it does, it magnifies the emotions because we're, we're basically doing what we're always doing from you know, stretching from the first 15 pitch at school, except now it's at Newlands in a semi-final from tens of thousand people and millions and watching. And you haven't just got the hopes and dreams of yourself and your team that you're playing for and you don't want to let down. But I was wearing a red rose on my shirt that day, and which obviously means I'm representing my nation, my country. And and when you are in a, uh, an environment like that and, and the highs are fantastically high when you represent them to the standard that you want to, but when you don't, meet those standards and you do feel you've let them down yeah you do feel low i mean because you because you, you're bearing the weight of a nation literally on your shoulders yeah. as well as myself and um yeah uh, so coming off that pitch was very difficult that day um and indeed since but uh, to a certain extent you put things in perspective it is a sport etc but yeah at the, t- at the day very low and um uh, i think i might have mentioned the story to you paul but uh to just to add insult to injury i came off the pitch uh, in time on tradition, went to the opposition changing room to offer my shirt in exchange with the great man. Um, uh, but for whatever reason, I came out of that dressing room without one. He, uh, he, de- <laughs> uh, he didn't, oh, no. feel it was, uh, didn't feel I'd obviously gained enough respect with him to uh, to warrant having one in return. So that was a... I would have um, been baggy. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. Yes, <laughs> wouldn't have much to do with it. But uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, um, obviously just as, force that message you know i'd let myself down felt less the nation down to a certain extent and uh yeah didn't warrant a shirt from the opponent who's just uh always a, uh, you know puts, puts uh, salt amongst the wounds definitely well look um we had to talk briefly about the program as well it's based on your five roads to resilience sort of personal belief system tell us about the five roads sure well um it basically goes firstly with teamwork and it's something we're obviously going to talk about a little bit further now so I won't uh, 
uh, exploit too much. But the gist of it is, let's, you know, first things first, let's start a conversation with your team. Uh, number two, control the controllables. And the, the, um, the main element there is to basically say there are things you can and you can't control right now. And so many people spend their time just so fixated in the things they just can't do anything about right now. They lose a lot of um, time and energy focused on those things or, or wasted focus on those things when they should be really just as fixated as possible on the things that you can control. And the things you can control, take a really positive narrative about it and just turn it into your favor as much as you can so that you uh, start going in the right direction. Once you start doing that, number three plays its part, its prioritization of tasks. And it's really when you understand what you can and can't control, you just understanding, well, OK, that's all well and good. But what are the most important, the, the, the real nuts and bolts that you have to get right from the beginning? And you just have to focus all your uh, your efforts on as much as possible. Don't waste thing, time on things that might be deemed urgent because people are blaring out for their attention on, on you on these things. Sometimes you just got to put that aside, say no to certain things and just really focus on the important things first. Number four is called contingencies, and that's really another word for options. It's just uh, working on, and especially these times at the moment, we're facing such adversity, aren't we? Uh, but in these times of adversity, opportunities are there. And it's really just exploring with your team that you've started the conversation with, understanding what you can and can't do at the moment. Just really focusing on just ex ex um, expanding your options as much as you can. And even if you don't have uh, many options at, at, at hand, is really focus on if it's one plan just maybe focus on making it as good as you can be uh, make it flexible make it as efficient uh, as you possibly can number five sort of wrap things up really it's an attitude and it's having a real uh, real basis of just positive mental attitude about each of these roads that we're talking about and whether it's this road or another road you choose of your own you know uh, or you've explored elsewhere just have a real focus on the fact that you've got a belief, you've got a, a roadmap ahead of you, you've got a system to follow. Just have a belief in those uh, elements that are the relevant for you and just really put into practice, not just for yourself as an individual, but really instill that belief in your team as well. Now, I know what's in the programme, of course, and, and it's packed with great takeaways that will, well, I guess, apply to everyone. But just sum up for us what you want the programme to achieve. Well, I think, Paul, the priority for me is, you, you know, obviously we're focusing on this one story and it's involving a World Cup in a quarter, a semi-final of a game of rugby. And obviously people are going to look at that and think, well, that's not really relevant, and really relatable to, to the people tuning in. But I'm going to say it is. It's, it's this. I mean, the stresses and the strains, uh, it's the same we all face. It's just, as I've said, mine was in an office with a bigger audience and a few uh, higher hopes on your shoulders, etc. But they are the same stresses and strains. And and so what I found out in your life in a way through looking back at my past experiences, and not just in sport and aviation, but also in life. And um, it's through looking back that I've seen just how I've taken these steps and how invaluable this roadmap has been for me. Everyone's going through this crisis right now and facing real challenges. And it's, it, it, for example, a real challenge for a lot of athletes out there face when they retire and they're questioning their identity and their place in the world and, and really facing a real issue about a real pivot in what they're doing. This is my third career change as it happens. Um, and what I want to do is pass on what I've learned, uh, the things that I've personally put into practice with this roadmap. Um, I've been given, a, as I said, a privilege to have the experience I've had in the past, but it's also this privilege comes a, a platform of which I want to share with others. And well, we're just about out of time, Tony. So hopefully it gives everyone a flavor for at least what's in store. There's obviously a lot more at wordplaygroup.com or you could just search Tony Underwood and you'll find your way to us. Uh, and of course, we'd love to see you there. So bye for now.